DuPont Aerospace. Tony DuPont uh, experiences chief, chief aerospace of, of aerospace advanced design at Douglas Aircraft and director of product planning and management advanced propulsion engines at the Garrett Corporation had convinced, has convinced him that a new company was needed to look into the prospects of the, the, uh, national, the what's now become the National Aerospace Plane, the single stage to orbit with hypersonic aircraft, air breathing vehicle to get into orbit. Mr. DuPont's experience in first of first designing of designing the first hypersonic aircraft at Douglas and later designing and developing a hypersonic ramjet and transonic turbofans at Garrett Research convinced him that the manufacturing oriented experience at the highest professional level in both air, aircraft and engines would be required to successfully develop these propulsions. Tony DuPont is going to be talking about his original ideas about of the single stage to work with the air breathing vehicle. Thank you very much. Tony. Okay, I'm going to start off with a uh, sort of historical perspective from the beginning to the end of uh, the single stage air breathing to earth airplanes. First slide, the, the first slide is a Republic uh, aviation uh, airplane that was uh, designed in the early 1960s, which is about the time that the supersonic combustion ramjet was invented by uh, Dr. Tony Ferry. And using uh, his performance numbers, uh, they claimed you could make a single stage to orbit airplane. Uh, this particular design eventually flunked out. As you can see, it's a, a total of flying engine, and it had too much engine, and the weight of the engines eventually uh, precluded its feasibility. Uh, also, there was a lot of questions about the feasibility of the supersonic combustion ramjet itself that weren't answered for uh, several years. Uh, when I was at uh, Douglas, I worked for Max Hunter, I heard something about lunchtime. And, uh, I wasn't really permitted to uh, explore this concept beyond a certain point because there was no test data at the higher Mach numbers that said that the supersonic combustion of ramjet would be the work, let alone to get a specified performance. And it's uh, been many years uh, to reach a point where that's been nailed down well enough that you could actually build something to a specification. Maybe I, I got sort of a course. Uh, uh, Pro here, maybe I can use a microphone. Sure, go ahead. There's a point up there. This yes, it's really pretty uptown. <laughs> okay, th this is what drives the uh, single stage to orbit air breathing airplane. Uh, this is the uh, energy efficiency of the uh, scramjet engine as opposed to the uh, rocket engine. Uh, this number is uh, directly related to uh, specific impulse or uh, pounds of thrust per pound of fuel per second. So the higher the specific impulse, the uh, higher the efficiency. So that this number can be directly converted to a specific impulse used in the rocket equation if you want to. The advantage of the uh, thermal efficiency for back the envelope calculations is for a scramjet, it's uh, relatively constant throughout the uh, high speed acceleration range where the scramjet really operates. So you can use a single number in an equation that's similar to the rocket equation and uh, get the fuel fraction directly. Uh, also, it gives a sort of a fundamental insight as to uh, what's going on. So the, if you get the oxygen out of the air instead of taking it with you, um, you can get very high fractions of the energy released to burning fuel uh, applied to accelerate the vehicle. You see numbers in there at the uh, Mach 12 region that, that are actually over 60%. Uh, the calibration on what that means, uh, the uh, numbers that go with uh, the kind of engine that uh, some of you flew in on, uh, namely a turbofan or a Boeing 737 or something, uh, those numbers are down around 30%. So this uh, potentially was a very uh, highly efficient device, uh, provided that it didn't eat up the efficiency with uh, shock losses 
other skin friction and so forth at very high Mach numbers. And most of the research that's gone on between the early 1960s when that Republic airplane was laid out today has been to nail down fairly conclusively as to what those losses really are. And uh, they're relatively small uh, as a percent at the high Mach numbers. Not, not that they're not big losses, but the denominator, which is the energy in the airflow, is so high that the uh, efficiencies of the various compounds uh, move up toward 100%. But that went against the grain of uh, the aeronautical engineering community for many years. So nozzle is just, in my experience with nozzle is you can't get more than 97 and a half percent efficiency no matter what you do the kind of argument. Even though they had test data as 98 and a half, why that, they would still say that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, it took a long time to, for uh, people actually had to work the problem for themselves before they would believe it, that you could get efficiencies uh, of maybe over 99 percent in some cases depending on the definition of a neurological speed. Okay, the next slide uh, moves in on the uh, experimental data that was uh, gradually accumulated between the early 1960s to today. In the 60s, we had a hypersonic airplane flying, the X-15, and, uh, and one uh, memorable day, I was uh, back in uh, Washington, and I had uh, every expert that Douglas Company had to offer. I had the propulsion expert, the rocket expert, the stability control expert, aerodynamicist, and so forth. A total of about 14 people to brief NASA on our uh, then orbital airplane, which was, uh, we couldn't make a single stage. We had a single airplane, but we refueled it at Mach 6 and a half so that we could get in that orbit. And uh, when we got through, the answer to me was very disappointing. NASA said, well, you just outlined a, a very, uh, a large and expensive uh, engineering program and we think you can do everything you say you're going to do. We're not going to do it, but we're interested in research and uh, don't you have some problems that uh, need research? And I said, yeah, this uh, supersonic combustion ramjet might enable a single stage to orbit airplane, but uh, nobody can certify in our Douglas Company design world that such a thing even exists. We need test data. And the claims range all the way from Tony Ferry that says you can get fantastic performance at orbital speed to some people uh, at the United Technology say there isn't any such phenomenon in supersonic combustion. The truth has got to be at least somewhere is in between. So why don't you figure out some kind of experimental program to figure out uh, what really is going on? And if you nail it down enough, then we can start talking about these uh, single stage orbit airplanes. So the next slide shows what they did. As after we left, they had a meeting amongst themselves and said, well, why don't we have an experimental program? We'll fly something on the X-15 and uh, figure out uh, what works and what doesn't. And uh, this program later on was known as the uh, hypersonic uh, research engine. Uh, uh, initially, it was called something else. It was the HS Elimination Race. <laughs> They're going to separate fact from fiction on this uh, new engine. I didn't realize that uh, I would uh, ever be involved in this. And when they came around to Douglas and asked uh, what uh, what we thought of it, uh, our reply was we didn't think uh, it was a very good program for the reason that not, not that you, the engine wouldn't work, but that you would have a hard time uh, getting the data in, in a transitory uh, flight test environment. So little did I know, a few years later, I would be building this engine. And true enough, the biggest problem wasn't the engine. The biggest problem was to try to figure out how to get a data acquisition that would get the data on the run, so to speak. We only had 40 seconds worth of test time. So the airplane was modified, as shown here, with uh, additional tankage. And the uh, lower fin was removed and replaced by the experimental engine. And the next slide shows <coughs> the uh, airplane in flight with a uh, boilerplate version of that engine. And this engine uh, was just a steel boilerplate, literally. It was made by the flight test people at Edwards. And they didn't ask us about it. They didn't tell us that they were doing it. If they had, I would have told them they needed a lot more weighted material on the tail. And uh, as a result of not having enough, they burned a big hole in the lower tail. And uh, the history is silent on whether the uh, damage was sufficient to drop the engine off or they ignited the explosive bolts, which were the emergency separation to jettison the engine. Anyway, the engine part company with the airplane that dug a big hole in the desert. The X-15 was taken in for extensive repairs. 
but uh, <coughs> nonetheless, if uh, uh, Congress has been willing, or NASA has been willing, either one, to continue flying the X-15 for a few more years, we would have accomplished in about 1970 what the Russians accomplished December 15, 1991, namely a Mach 8 flight of a supersonic combustion ram jet. Okay, the next slide shows what happened after the X-15 was canceled. Uh, in 1968, the uh, engine was tested in ground facilities. The uh, facility on the left is the NASA Lion Restructures Tunnel, and that had uh, Mach 8, uh, Mach number capability, and Mach 8 uh, total temperature capability, but for safety reasons, they wouldn't allow any oxygen in the tunnel. It was a nitrogen atmosphere, so we could only do a structural test. So the flight engine was tested in that facility, and then on the right, a uh, water-cooled, uh, sort of semi boilerplate engine was tested at uh, NASA Lewis. And uh, there they had uh, a facility that was designed for the nuclear rocket where they heated nitrogen to uh, very high temperatures and diluted it with oxygen to make uh, the equivalent of Mach 7 air. And the idea was this was going to be clean air so that the, uh, uh, wouldn't have the uh, chemical constituents that come from burning either uh, hydrogen or hydrocarbons in air in order to uh, heat the air to the Mach 7 conditions, which is the way all the other facilities used to work. And the, uh, it wasn't quite as pure as all that. The uh, uh, carbon reactor kept disintegrating. The model got hit with a lot of chunks of carbon. There was a certain amount of CO and CO2 in the atmosphere. Nonetheless, the, the test was successful and the engine made the specification performance. And the, uh, the uh, structural tests were even more successful. The uh, engine survived well in Mach 8 and went for several cycles. And relative to the uh, cost problem, uh, I think the general Graham put his finger on it. It's uh, getting rid of the 60 million people that support a launch is, is where most of the cost reduction is going to have to come from. And we didn't uh, inspect this engine particularly or uh, massage it at all between tests. We just ran it as often as the tunnel would run. So it's already demonstrated that you could turn it around uh, just like you can a JT9D on the 747. The next slide shows uh, the uh, flight engine that just before we shipped it in 1968. And uh, relative to today's environment, this whole uh, hypersonic engine research program cost the taxpayers $40 million, including the government laboratory portion of the program. Uh, admittedly, those are 1960 and early 1970 dollars, but that's still uh, hugely inexpensive compared to what people are talking about today. And the other thing that's interesting is the timing. We were awarded the contract to build this engine after a competitive runoff in 1966. And the contract was awarded in August. Uh, it didn't get around to actually giving us the money until the following January. And we still shipped the engine in October of 1968. Uh, never been done before. We had an awful lot of uh, teething problems and learning problems to, to get this thing done. But we didn't have a lot of supervision. <laughs> Uh, the key to success of this engine was the uh, ability to cool it with the liquid hydrogen. And this is a, a hugely blown up picture of the hydrogen cooling fins that are raised onto the skin of the engine. That uh, checkered polka dot arrangement underneath, that's the actual engine structure. That's like a sixteenth of an inch cylinder, let's say, in the combustor region. And then raised to that are these uh, offset fins, which are very small. They, the picture doesn't do it justice. It told, tells you the dimensions, uh, like uh, 40 thousandths wide and 50 thousandths high, but that's really tiny. That's like the uh, width of a normal lead pencil. And to those fins are braided by 15 thousandths skin, and the fuel is, is flowed through those passages uh, underneath the skin and picks up the heat that's uh, transferred to the walls. And so that gave us the freedom to build an air breathing engine to virtually any shape that the aerodynamics required and still be able to cool it. For instance, this engine had struts that supported the uh, inside body and the outside body, and they, you know, they were right in the middle of the cluster with uh, fairly blunt leading edges. And, and uh, those things uh, survived. Uh, the 
very, very high heating rates, but we're still able to cool them using this technique. The, uh, to show you what you can do and put your mind to it, the leading edges of this engine in Macau were 60,000 an inch in diameter. And uh, they were designed for a heating rate of 10,000 BTUs per square foot per second. It was an unwritten law by uh, Doc Rupert, who was a NASA program manager in this job, that even though the X-15 would only go to Mach 8, the engine had to be able to go faster in case they ever had a way of testing at higher speeds. So the engine could have, from a structural point of view, gone all the way to orbit if we had an airplane to put it on. So that was part of the uh, engine background when uh, NASA came along. But you, you still have to build the uh, airplane structure and uh, the, uh, don't have time to get into details of this, but uh, one of the uh, features of all the hypersonic airplanes that we designed at Douglas and also our initial mass vehicle that we'll show you in a minute was that the uh, hydrogen tank was a, a big thermos bottle. It was a vacuum space between the tank wall and the outer shell. So the outer shell had to be airtight, and there was a lot of questions about could you make a thin honeycomb panel layer tight? These panels are made by uh, spot welding the honeycomb surface to the skin. And every spot weld is a potential leak. And uh, we had to work with a vendor who was Aztec uh, up in uh, the Santa Ana area uh, to come up with a special welding process that would prevent that. Anyway, long story short, this panel was built as part of our NASP effort. We uh, pressurized it with helium and put it in a plastic bag to see if it would leak. And uh, no helium leaked into the bag, and so it was not only airtight, it was helium tight. And the other thing that was important about it, the skins on this panel were 8,000 an inch thick. And uh, there was a question of how tight a tolerance could you keep on the skin gauge, because if you're off by a couple thousand, that's 25% of the gauge. It's either 25 percent too weak, or it's 25 percent too heavy, depending on whether it's plus or minus. And uh, so the result was that uh, in this particular panel, the uh, tolerance on the skin gauge was held within uh, six tenths of a thousandth of an inch. So it made it both from a fabrication point of view and a uh, air tightness point of view. And as an experimental panel, I'll tell you, the darn thing cost about a thousand dollars a pound, see, which is about one-tenth of some of this exotic space structure that people talking about in production. Okay, this is the, uh, now we're getting into the NASP. The, the NASP was uh, a result of, of years and years and years of trudging back to Washington to see if anybody was interested in an experimental uh, hypersonic airplane. And uh, the, we first made a, a formal proposal to NASA in 1972. That was for a uh, Mach 12 airplane weighed 15,000 pounds. We guarantee Mach 12 and uh, attempt to get Mach 14. And that was to be a prototype of an airplane that uh, went to Mach 14 on ramjets and then went on a single uh, space shuttle main engine the rest of the way. But uh, nobody was interested in 1972. In 1973, uh, Congress appropriated some money to wind tunnel test the engine. I think it was $350,000. President Nixon impounded that part of NASA's funds. And uh, it wasn't until uh, 1984 that it actually got money to do that test. And uh, so every uh, two or three months, I go back to Washington to see if anybody was interested in hypersonics. In those years, it was almost illegal to talk about it. But then in 1982, uh, there was some interest, particularly at the DARPA maybe coincide with uh, General Graham's uh, stimulation of the uh, SDI idea. I mean, to make SDI work out is to get that cheaper ways to get into orbit. So I had, uh, for one reason or another, DARPA was interested. And on April 1st, uh, 1983, I met with uh, Dr. Cooper, who was the then head of DARPA. And that was the beginning of the NAS program, as we know it today. It started out much more modestly with uh, doing some critical testing and so forth. I think the first year, uh, the good news is we had 50% of DARPA's uh, uh, budget uh, that was put on this thing. The bad news is the total budget was $60,000. <laughs> uh, after that, the uh, budget got bigger and our percentage of it declined rapidly. But uh, this airplane was the airplane that, that we designed at DARPA's request. 
as the uh, uh, what they call the government baseline. Initially, all the large aerospace contractors, uh, engine contractors, and airplane contractors, who were supposed to use this airplane and engine as the basis of their design. And the idea was that if they could figure out some way to improve it, that uh, they would uh, document the improvement and the program might say, that's okay, you can change it. That lasted for about two engineering changes, and then everybody rebelled and wanted to do their own thing. And, and uh, the uh, government baseline as a design uh, sort of got submerged into the individual designs of the various companies. And, uh, but most of what's in NAS today really came from this airplane. Those features have been around in a different shape or something, or materials have changed, but it's still the same basic engine cycle in airplanes. Day. Now, the, 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 uh, at this point, people usually ask, Mr. Pot, what makes you think this airplane is really going to work? And the next slide uh, kind of walks you around as to what the engineering evidence is on the various issues. Uh, this, to reiterate what this is, this was the airplane that we supplied as a government baseline to DARPA uh, for $30,000 in 1983. Uh, $30,000 isn't much money, but this represented a $40 million investment in 1960 dollars in the hypersonic research engine. And a budget that I had as Chief of Advanced Design at Douglas when I worked in hypersonic airplanes in today's dollars would be between seven and ten million dollars a year for several years. So in today's dollars, we're talking about the investment behind this thing was probably $100 million at least. So don't be put off by, you know, it wasn't a $30,000 thing. Um, the airplane was a 50,000 pound airplane, and that was in response to the question, what was the smallest airplane that would uh, demonstrate the single stage door of the technology that is actually back into orbit and come back, carrying the uh, payload for the flight test instrumentation only. The airplane was made entirely of existing materials. Uh, the structure was made of nickel alloy, both the engine and the air, external part of the airframe. The hydrogen tank was made of uh, uh, graphite epoxy composite. And uh, that's a big advantage over the aluminum tankage that had hitherto been used for hydrogen tanks because it, it's, it's lighter even on a, a one-shot basis, but when you put the criteria of multiple use on the aluminum tank, you allow the stress goes down quite a bit, the difference between composite and aluminum becomes much larger. So when all said and done, you're probably cutting the weight of the tank wall in half by going to the composite material. Uh, there were some questions about whether the composite material would work. Uh, there was a question initially of uh, would it hold hydrogen? So uh, we built some, as I think it will, it just has to be made carefully. Uh, and if it's not, it won't. If it is, it will. So we, Prove that by getting some uh, very carefully made laminates from a Sikorsky aircraft and testing them with Donald Douglas, a uh, rig that we used to use for the uh, Saturn installation test. And uh, we'd uh, uh, put a little thing about the size of a silver dollar between two steel flanges and pressurize them with hydrogen to see if any hydrogen leaked across the, the sample. And then we could uh, dump it in uh, liquid nitrogen to see if it worked when it was cold. Uh, we uh, we uh, thermally cycled that sample by dropping it into liquid helium and fishing it out several times, which is a thermal shock, much worse than filling the tank. And uh, if it was a, a well-made sample, it would survive all those tests and, and not leak hydrogen. If it was a, a poorly made sample, it would usually fail and have it start to leak after the first thermal cycle. And the reason for that is a, a poorly made sample has resin-rich areas and the resin cracks under the little tiny cracks under a thermal cycle and that leaves a passage for the hydrogen to leak through. So it was established that uh, it would hold hydrogen. The next question was, well, what are its properties of cryogenic temperatures? And we were all set to go through an elaborate test program and sort that out. And we found out that Joe Manhattan had already done that as part of the Centaur upgrade. And the uh, make a long story short on that, the properties of cryogenic temperatures are about the same as they are in room temperature. All of a sudden, uh, all the great skepticism about uh, composite tank walls disappeared, and that's become kind of a standard way of doing it. The uh, carbon leading edges 
that's carbon carbon composite where the uh, epoxy is replaced by a pure carbon. And those are the same kind of materials used on the leading edges of the space shuttle. And uh, that's very good structural material, it's stronger at 3,000 degrees than it is at room temperature. The problem with it is it also burns, so that you have to protect it with uh, uh, some kind of coating, uh, silicon carbide. Coating. Usually the uh, coating that's good at one temperature isn't good at another, so you have a, maybe a combination of coatings where one becomes soft enough to fill the cracks and other coating cracks, that sort of thing. So they, in, in fairly massive sections like leading engines, uh, this is a well-proven commodity. You know, thin sections, uh, people are much more skeptical of the coatings that are going to work. The problem not the material, the problem is the coating. Uh, our design goal was to everything the airplane had to be good for at least a thousand flights. Uh, the leading edges we're not sure of. Uh, nobody will tell you in the shuttle community how long those leading edges are really good for. So, so we might have to replace the leading edges uh, long before a thousand flights. But, uh, if you wanted to, you could make a hydrogen cooled leading edge uh, like we have in the engine, and uh, you know, that would last forever, but then you'd have to actively cool a part of the airplane that you otherwise wouldn't have to. The, uh, moving down the lower left-hand corner, uh, the Boeing Company, uh, along with all the other contractors involved in the program at that time, were supplied drawings of the airplane, and they made some beautiful wind tunnel models based on the drawings, and they were tested with NASA Langley from, through a speed range from about uh, Mach 6 tenths to uh, Mach 22. So the drag level and stability parameters have been well verified by wind tunnel tests. This is a, a statically stable airplane in pitch, and it's a statically stable directionally at low angle attack, and it's dynamically stable at high angle attack, like the space shuttle is. So the result is you might not want to do this for precision of getting into orbit, but you can fly the airplane by hand all the way from a standing start to orbit. And more importantly, being statically stable, if you lose an engine or something, the airplane uh, doesn't get away from you. The, uh, the engine uh, was starting up the uh, right-hand side of the chart now. The uh, low-speed engine uh, was a combined cycle. I uh, can't give you the details of it, unfortunately, but um, th this uh, engine was well tested at the uh, General Applied Science Laboratories. That's what the GASL stands for. That's uh, Dr. Tony Ferry's old outfit. And they've been involved in hypersonic testing since there was any. That activity. And uh, we built a small engine there. Where the, uh, it was like a three inch slice of a half size engine as we then saw it. And uh, that worked very well. And they invited uh, General Scans to come in and uh, view the test. And uh, he was uh, sufficiently impressed that uh, he put $25 million into the program and asked if suddenly became a, a large uh, program headed toward the construction. The uh, ramjet portion of the uh, flight from which lasts from roughly Mach 3 to Mach 8 uh, was covered by the uh, engine built for the X-15 and we just used that experimental data like it was and said well, we can get that level of performance with the crew and Nora Dunn. The uh, hard part is the upper uh, right hand thing. The, there aren't any uh, all up wind tunnels you can use to test these engines in beyond Mach 8. And as opposed to the uh, Delta Clipper kind of thing that uh, Max Hunter uh, has been working on, where the rocket engine is a well-known quantity, so now you're predicating the whole project on, on an engine that you can't really test, and you have to rely on the analysis. And uh, that turned out to be a much bigger problem than I or anybody else thought it was going to be in 1983, when Dr. Cooper said, well, why should we go and through this all over again when we did it in the 60s. What's different between 1980s and 1960s? So well, now you have these uh, computer programs that can stand in for a wind tunnel test where the uh, wind tunnel testing isn't really possible by like orbital speed. So that, for many years, I, I regretted those words because we had so much trouble with the uh, computer on slow dynamics not really giving uh, good answers. But say with uh, some certainty that the, uh, the engine does work at high speed and the, 
uh, computerized flow dynamics says that it does work and the computerized flow dynamics is correct. So how do you know it's correct without a test? Well, the, for one thing, the uh, conservation of uh, mass, momentum, and energy across that particular solution is, is 1 20th of 1 percent. And uh, the, uh, there's other tests you can do to change the grid and so forth, and the answer doesn't change. So it's passed all the checks. And uh, besides that, it agrees with a, a classical aerodynamic analysis. And, uh, so that we're quite confident of, of the numbers in the uh, high-speed regime. Uh, the combustion test is only possible to bomb it up to about Mach 16, and the uh, combustor has been tested at Mach 16 with essentially 100% combustion efficiency. So as far as we're able to test it, the combustion system works. And let the nozzle with analysis that says that you know, the nozzle will work and you're ready to fly. Next chart. Uh, now we're going to digress to uh, what happened to that airplane. This is the uh, current uh, national team uh, design, which has a, a gross weight goal of uh, 325,000 pounds, which they're not sure they can meet. And uh, there's an explanation for all that, which I don't really think you need to hear. But uh, they're, they're aggressively trying to. Uh, get that squeezed down to something closer to the 50,000 pound weight. I don't see any technical reason why they won't be successful in that effort. But uh, where we stand today relative to the instruments of this group here, which is uh, some practical way of getting the work the cost, is in a way NASP has already uh, served its purpose by uh, focusing everybody's attention on the issues in a hypersonic airplane and doing as uh, much testing and analysis as anybody can dream up to uh, resolve these issues. The uh, information is at hand. You could build a production airplane that would really do it. And uh, the next chart shows what the, uh, I would say, the sort of the consensus opinion is as to what the cost of this airplane ought to be. Now, this is a chart that was uh, made by somebody in the Defense Department. Uh, it disagrees with General Graham's numbers. It put the shuttle up to $3,000 a pound. I believe he had it in there at something like uh, $7,800 a pound, which I think more likely what it really costs. But anyways, whether it's several thousand dollars a pound or not is not important. But we're down in the nominally $500 a pound. And I think if, you're, if you really did it right, you could be down there maybe $25 to $50 a pound. So uh, we're at least an order of magnitude below this device, and, and there's probably another order of magnitude to go below that if you did it right. Now, this comes partly from the size of the airplane. We talk about, uh, let's talk about the uh, uh, space shuttle type payload they showed here, which is 60,000 pounds. Well, if we made an airplane that was between five and 700,000 pounds, which is a uh, DC-10, 747 type spread, uh, we, we could talk about putting that kind of payload in a polar orbit. And so that's a huge reduction from the space shuttle, which Four and a half million pounds, but saving money per pound is not really where it's at. The same kind of thing that the Delta Clipper has is the airplane type of operation. Like maybe when you first build this airplane, it isn't 100% reliable. You're not sure everything's going to work, so you go out and fly it, and the pilot comes back and complains, and gives you a long list of things you got to fix. The mechanics fix it, and fly it again. That works. Something else goes wrong, and fix that. After a while, you know it's reliable because you tried it. And, and that, that's the way airplanes uh, have always got their reliability. So whether it's the mask or it's the Delta Clipper, that feature is the thing where you're going to save most of the money. You're going to reduce the number of people involved in the launch to a, a normal aircraft maintenance team of the thousands and thousands of people that are involved today. Now, in the size that they're talking about there, you know, 20,000 pounds, you can probably do that with a uh, 150 to 200,000 pound airplane. So the, uh, the, now you're talking about the, the physically the airplane is uh, not much different from the DC-9 and its gross weight is much different from the DC-9 and has that same feature that every place there's a maybe a 7,000 foot runway is just a potential space launching. 
but with no uh, special provisions required at all, except maybe some hydrogen trucks to bring the fuel in. And that if you uh, inadvertently have to go to the wrong place because of uh, an aborted flight, you can fly the airplane back as long as you can get fuel to it in any place in the world. I don't know how much time I got left. I entertain maybe a couple of questions. Do the Russians have any such effort? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, the, the Russians uh, have flown a Mach 8 ramjet uh, on uh, December 15th. Now, this was a, a throwaway ramjet. It was launched on a Tuesday vessel. And uh, probably, they didn't give the details, but it was probably an heat sink cool. But uh, nonetheless, uh, they did it. I mean, the, the, the typical uh, hypersonic establishment attitude is, well, you know, they, we had the technology in the 60s. We could have done it if we wanted to. And they probably stole all the technology. Well, that may all be true, but the fact is they did it. And then they, they want to claim that they have a, a, a very aggressive uh, airplane design and, and development activity going on. There's been some evidence of that that's leaked out over the years. So, for instance, they started a <coughs> <clears throat> hypersonic wind tunnel in 1968. That was the year we shut down almost all our hypersonic activity. And uh, that tunnel's been running around the clock ever since. They've got to be up to their ears in data. Well, can you tell us about this uh, pulse detonation engine, the Aurora vehicle, and its possible applications for the uh, NASP, uh, if the Aurora even exists? Okay. I don't know anything about the Aurora, so that question is easy. Uh, the pulse detonation engine, uh, I don't know any more about it than, than you do if you read the uh, Aviation Week article. Uh, the, the, the kind of uh, aircraft and engine we're talking about here uh, doesn't rely on that phenomena. This is a continuous flow thing where it, it, the airflow is, is compressed uh, area-wise to get enough of static temperature to support combustion, which is about one atmosphere. You release the fuel and it burns in a very short time because it doesn't stay in that two or three feet of combustion very long. And then it expands out in the nozzle to generate thrust. You have to get up to Mach 3 on the start. Yeah, ramjet, well, ramjet will operate below Mach 3, but yeah, basically uh, we use the uh, low speed acceleration cycle, whatever it is, uh, uh, up to uh, Mach 3. Are there any ideas or any further um, ideas about doing or uh, something similar to what the Russians have done for launching an expendable vehicle, like a large selling rocket with a scramjet stage on it? Uh, well, people have talked about that. Uh, uh, I mean, the, question. The, the, the question is, uh, is there any uh, thought about doing something like the Russians did, launching an expendable ramjet off of uh, a missile uh, booster? Yeah. And, yeah, the people have talked about that forever. And I think, the uh, first of all, it's a fairly expensive test. And uh, the uh, net gain from this point of doing it is, is pretty small. Uh, you don't get anywhere near the, you know, we had problems on the X-15 where we had a data acquisition system aboard the airplane and we could bring the engine back and all that kind of thing. So you can imagine how much information you can get off of a, an expendable test like that. So you said, okay, if it burned and you get some idea what the pressures were, you, you get very scant information on that kind of test compared to what you get out of a, a wind tunnel test. And our wind tunnel capability is up towards Mach 8, see, so that they're just flying just at the outer edge of where the wind tunnel capability was. Now, if that was a, a Mach 16 test, it would have been a lot more impressive. Yeah, what is the sort of characteristic size of, you know, you, you, you spray the hydrogen in from, you know, various struts. Is the spacing typically like an inch or three inches? Or I, I just want to get a feel for, no, if, if you're going to get it to mix quickly, you've got uh, a problem. So spacing is a, on the order of an inch. And, and I object to the word struts. In any yeah. engine that I've ever worked on, uh, we've never had any struts. Struts are a, a dead loss. Yeah. And, and they, they don't, the, the data says that they, the obstructions for the struts or wedges or whatever it is uh, doesn't really improve the mixing. And, and it, generates a lot of drag and, yeah. and, and uh, pressure loss. But it's, yeah, it's the, about an inch. Yeah, the, the, uh, well, okay, let's digress for a minute on, on that subject. The, um, there's two criteria for the fuel injectors. They have to, the hole has to be large enough so that the, uh, 
fuel will penetrate to the middle of the duct, see, so that, okay. that's one constraint. But then if the holes, in order to make them big, uh, get to be too far apart, then you'll have dead spaces between the holes, so that it's kind of a, a trade-off between the lateral spreading and the penetration out the middle of the flow that kind of, so the duct has to be uh, on the order of an inch high and the spacing has to be really less than an inch. Okay. What do we know about the, the engine that was on the Russian aircraft and whether or not there will be follow-on tests at higher speeds? Well, uh, Paul Sis, who used to be the uh, McDonnell Douglas program manager at NASP, is retired now, and he actually, believe it or not, has a contract for the Russians to try to uh, spread their technology in the United States or something. And, and he says that, that they have uh, uh, quite a few uh, engines and vehicles ready for test. So I, I expect there'll be a lot more testing, and particularly in the, uh, their, he says, I don't know what, what there's any other confirmations, is that they're on their third generation of uh, combined cycle acceleration engines. A, co a combined cycle is some gadget that has a heat exchanger on it that condenses the, uh, the air and then you inject the hot air into the engine somewhere. And uh, so he says they're on their third generation of that kind of uh, engine a flight test. So I think, you, I think the war will be heard from uh, deepest Siberia on this before we're through. Where are they going to get their funding? Uh, I don't know, but if, if the Russians are half as smart as we often give them credit for, I think they probably have some groups of people over there just like the group in this room that think there's a tremendous potential in uh, non-military space and, and they're pursuing it whatever resources they have. And uh, maybe they're far-sighted enough to look ahead that, you know, after peace is declared, that, and now finally maybe there's an opportunity to really do something worthwhile. So I, I think more will be heard from, and, and somehow they'll get enough money to keep it going, just, just out of sheer dedication. And the information you have, is, do, are they using the same uh, low, low Mach number uh, cycle that, that uh, uh, we are? The only thing I know about that is what Paul says. It's, it's one of those uh, combined cycles that uses a heat exchanger to make liquid air, and then they, uh, uh, they burn some fuel to make that into a hot compressed gas and inject it somewhere in the engine. But exactly what the details of the cycle are, I, I have no idea. Any other questions? I think my time is up. Uh, We're now on schedule.